We had some uh, we had some mixed reviews on our on our last podcast. <laughs> it's interesting. Interesting to say the least. I feel like most of the negative reviews are probably people who are fans of his. That's fine. Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't have to always agree with us. It's crazy. Yeah, you can be wrong too. Um, Me? <laughs> oh, them. Yeah, yeah they can great. be wrong too. Uh, no, the... <sighs> Was he being serious about Taylor Swift? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you people have no idea. <laughs> yeah i'll 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 post some pictures on the next podcast uh, I, I do like uh another commenter had suggested this a few weeks back because they're like i'm just here like basically like i hate you guys you suck i don't want to listen to what you guys have to say about anything else other than like the specific topic he didn't say that but that's how i feel rude and uh go ahead and hit that subscribe button <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> he he suggested throwing in like a timestamp to skip to like the meat and oh, stuff God. I think I'll try and start doing that because obviously we kind of we yeah. kind of slow roll into these. It's fine. God, get off our back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, imagine clicking a video. I mean, because these are like hour long videos. Imagine clicking the video. <laughs> if you've never watched our stuff right. before, having to sit, like suffer through twenty minutes of us talking. You, you know what? I'm just, I'm gonna put something out there for you folks, especially you, you guy, whatever your name was. Uh, I'm assuming. Well, with your attitude, you may not have many friends, but I'm assuming you have friends. And just imagine if some of the, the, the talks you and your friends have, I would imagine that not everyone's going to enjoy those. Yeah. But as a middle-aged white guy with a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know what? We can do whatever we want. So there's that. Uh, we like to dip our feet in other I want to, before we... Yeah, you know what? There's going to be some more stuff before this one. Uh, before we dip into the mouse, uh, this is take number 937 of mouse. Yeah, we're diagnosing. So, okay, this would be this is the third time I'm giving this speech. We're doing this uh, this podcast. Obviously, this is a new, new place. We're at the boardroom or conference room of Ally Outdoors, the gun store that we're both involved with. And we are, uh, we're going to start trying to film up here, do some cool stuff because – it's a lot easier to get people here than our other location. Uh, we have people coming through all the time. They only have an hour. Yeah. And uh, reps from these awful rifle manufacturers. Yeah. They can't uh, from build the sub and way around. The people pushing the conspiracies. <laughs> um, Big rifle. And, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to kind of give ourselves more flexibility on filming to be able yeah. to do better content and do things like, Obviously, like we personally have a lot of stuff, but then you know at the store we're gonna have way more product. So like just like this video where we're gonna be going over scope mounts, it's uh nice we can go gr actually just grab a bunch of scope mounts, lay them out, and kind of yeah, I don't have to take all my personal stuff apart and, and all that because I mean, mm, I think I have all these mounts. Yeah, yeah, I do, but they're all mounted on stuff and everything else. Like it's. I'm more excited about like being able to grab people and bring them up here real fast and doing you know yeah. like a podcast because I mean you know we talk to reps and everything else and which some of them, some companies are going to have some weird stipulations but for the most part like reps are pretty for the most part most of the reps who are repping this kind of stuff for the most part are uh, hunters themselves or they do some sort of hunting and they'll they'll know stuff about the product that they may be able to give you a little bit more in depth talk about certain things so like the future of the future of like being able to do it up here is just awesome. Like I'm, I'm excited. Like it just, and we'll be able to easily host more people. It's like in our other studio, it's smaller and it's really more optimal for like just me and one other person, maybe a, one other person. So three people, including well, four including yourself. But it just makes things a lot easier. You know, we'll well, be able to do more cool stuff. But we mess or. You know, somebody that wasn't me or Wade, you know, just a, a named person messed up. Uh, the audio was not usable from the last two we filmed, which one of which was uh, with another rifle manufacturer. Yeah, Sergeant Marms. I'm sad that one went away because it was fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, we cut up quite a bit. And there were some announcements made on there that, uh, well, I'll go ahead and like just briefly say that. Like, they're, by the time you watch this, they may have it available or they're taking orders. Do you remember what they said? Maybe taking orders. Just reach out to Sergeant Arms, and they're officially taking orders on 22 Arc. Now, unfortunately for y'all, 
that podcast, we covered a lot of the preliminary data. But if you're on YouTube, they have created a 22 art page and they are publishing that data. Very interesting. Uh, we yeah. will redo a podcast with them because we enjoy talking to the Sarge Arm guys. They're fun. Yeah, yeah. We talked a lot about, you know, tuning a gun and, you know, different yeah, things. Got into, again, like when we have certain people on here or we do certain podcasts, certain things, like all the time, question, more questions come up and we address a lot of those. Like we're just going to sit here and tell you about how great that podcast was you're never going to see. Yeah. But before we get into mouths, I want to address something that's, it didn't really bother me, but it's like, are you gonna, uh, what are you going to bully somebody else? Yes. <laughs> we addressed something, a comment that got made about uh, the, what would you say, the the form factor of our podcast, of the TPH podcast. And, uh, you know, most people get it by now. Like, we're kind of, it's not, it's not just predator hunting. It's all things. And if you, if you actually listen and, like, you know, ingest the content, a lot of stuff feeds back into predator hunting. But, uh, yeah, we cover a lot of stuff. We <clears throat> we cover a lot of gear and thoughts and opinions. And, like, the video uh, we just did was probably, like, our, our first, like, veer off the normal path. Because like, by now people know, like, we're not just going to talk about predator hunting tactics and tips. We're going to talk about gear a lot. Well, yeah, because you can you can only show so much, and we we've already done a lot of those. And yeah, and we've done a lot. And, you know, I usually save the the conversation about tips and tactics when I have other people in here because I think anybody who just wants to sit here and I'm not attacking another pod, predator hunting podcast, they're great. Like, and that's that's why I'm going to recommend you if you just want to hear always about tips and tactics and everything else. Like, Fox Pro does a lot with MFK guys. They talk about tips and tactics a lot. There's Jeff. Jeff's podcast, they talk about calling stuff a lot. Uh, there's some other podcasts out there that they really lead into like the actual calling and everything else. But the way I look at it is, is the, kind of the way I hunt is there is no like one single way to do it. Now, we have done several 12 minute talks in the past, six minute talks about, you know, little tips and tricks and tactics. But I'm going to save most of that type, type of stuff for when I have other people in here because I like to conversate as, a, as it pertains to tactics and sounds and everything else with another person so we're you know that's just not we that's not what we've ever we never set out to be just that like we're all things uh but if you if you really ingest that weed the, smoking again. <laughs> oh yeah while you're on the topic i don't smoke weed but uh sorry i was giggling but anyways we're always going to have people within the industry that ties back into it in here. We're always going to be talking about gear and everything else because, you know, I think when we, when we, when we set ourselves aside from others, we don't just talk about tips and tactics and whatnot. We cover everything. And a lot of what my opinion, the lot of your biggest headache, if we're talking about from like a newcomer's pr perspective, a lot of your biggest headache is gear and knowing what the newest gear is, what the best gear for this, that, uh, calibers and everything else. That's where I'm going to, you know, I like to teach. I enjoy it. I like to, I like to share my opinions, my knowledge I've gathered over the years. So potentially it could save you some headache, time, money, everything else. So that's kind of what we're going to do. And you know, if that's not your thing, then you don't have to watch it, but we hope you do. <laughs> uh, but anyways, moving on, I just wanted to clear the air. Now, did I clear the air enough? Like, like, we're not just, I know it has the name Texas Predator Hunting uh, Podcast. And then we went back and forth on that. Like, should it be that? Because we are going to cover such a gamut. But at the end of the day, like, so much of what we're going to do is going to be focused around predator hunting. You just need, like, you need to open your eyes and see the big picture, I guess. Like, all this stuff we're about to talk about is, you know, not only for predator hunting, it's for, you know, shooting sports and everything else in general. But if you're a predator hunter and you're putting together an AR with a thermal or whatever the case may be, uh, it would be nice if you could go somewhere and really learn a lot about mounts. And, you know, I don't know. I just wanted to clear that up because it's, you know, I'm not sure there's always going to be certain people like, this is a Texas predator podcast. And you you haven't talked about predator hunting in a hot minute. Well, it's coming also. Like, yeah, we took a little bit longer break than we did the year before from getting guests and talking about predator hunting, but there's also like, we roll a lot of our content off of suggestions. I mean, some stuff is like something that pops up that week, but a lot of the stuff is suggestions 
And when an overwhelming majority of predator hunters are reaching out to me and going, I want to know what mounts for an AR. I want to know what caliber is the best for this and that's best for that. And we're going to do podcasts over that. Cause like, that's the whole point. Like that's kind of the, what, well, if we talk strictly predator hunting, it would, uh, it also put us in one category. Like, well, not only that, it would like, there's only so much content. You yeah. Can. At a certain point, like, I mean, I could talk about predator hunting for hours. Don't get me wrong. I yeah. About theories and everything else. But like I said, I enjoy having someone else here to conversate about that with, as opposed to just me. I'm I'll, judging on. I'll just, I'll Fitzy just falling asleep. redefine everything you say. Uh, we can do whatever we want because it's our podcast. And if you don't do, like it, go with do, a different one. Do middle aged podcast. Fuck it. Yeah. I'm not middle aged till next year, damn it. Uh, you're there. So get over it. You know, I don't know. I enjoy it. I just wanted to clear that up. Like that's not all with you. Abby. It's it's way more interesting when we get guests in there because that's. I think most people by this point know most of your opinions. On yeah, I mean a lot of the, so it's not interesting until you're like comparing and contrasting. Right, like oh, you had this happen. Why well, had this happen? Like you know, and I typically every year I kind of change, micro tweak my tactics and everything else. But for the most part, a lot of stuff kind of stay the same. Uh, New gear comes out more often and like new sounds and all that kind of stuff. So, but like the, the, it's just like being a good shot. The basic fundamentals typically stay the same for me, but like I will change my tactics and everything else, my gear more than anything. But like, you know, just, I just don't, that's not what we're going to do. We're not going to sit here and just talk about predator hunting like 24 seven, like, I'm going to wait until there's more people in there and, you know, hold your horses. It's we're, we're finally, we had a inc- super increased workload for a hot minute. And, uh, just being able to do these me and Fitzy alone was just most optimal because our schedules were crazy. We, I didn't want to do that to people, and, but we're, we're getting more people scheduled. It's coming. Uh, they're coming back and we're going to be talking more about predator hunting, but the reality of the situation is. My whole want for this entire podcast for years, you know, if you haven't watched some of the previous episodes, kind of going back real fast is originally before podcasts or even I even knew about them. I wanted a YouTube channel where I just interviewed other people in or surrounding like predator hunting industry, meaning firearms, optics, predator hunters themselves, trappers, uh, wildlife biologists, all kinds of stuff like that. That I wanted that more than anything. And, and it, you know, quite selfishly is because I find other people interesting that especially within this core industry. So I don't know, you know, I don't know why I'm, I feel like I owe this guy an explanation. <laughs> I just, you know, just to reiterate, uh, the reason why we chose the name is because it was easy. Like, because our, our roots are grounded in Texas spreader hunting and it was just an easy route to go. And maybe someday we'll have another spinoff podcast where we can start separating certain topics more. But that was another thing we talked about a lot. Like, should we have standalone podcasts for individual topics? Like, should all the white tail stuff go over here? Should all the long range hunting stuff go over here? Should all the predator hunting stuff go over here? Should the gun industry stuff go over here? Well, the problem with that starting out is like, we couldn't get enough guests to consistently produce uh, all that stuff and be launching them once a week. Like, and who knows later down the road when time is more available, more people are on staff, like full time editors and everything else. Maybe at that point you can and you're able to. Like, you have enough of a a guest roster and everything else to just constantly be putting like separate them and put out different content for the people who clearly have problems with us getting into different categories but anyways let's get to mounts uh obviously he prefaced uh let everyone know what's up with up here and everything else it is officially time to do the ar mounts uh now the good thing about the first audio getting you know waxed is uh there was some mounts I was able to remember to get this time. And I made double sure I had all the mounts I wanted and all the stuff I wanted to show y'all. But I mean, <clears throat> you know, in this, this, uh, optics mounts campaign we've been having here, I think, uh, it's worth mentioning again, that the most important part is you properly install these mounts. 
And by doing so, you should have some sort of torque device, torque reading device, torque limiting device, whatever you want to call it. And as always, we recommend fixed it sticks because they're great. Uh, and if you know, Fitz usually interjects about now, but he's preoccupied over there. If I'm you sorry, have the new 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser with the 1958 trim level, <laughs> if you have a wheeler, don't leave it adjusted on it. Oh, yeah, always decompress that spring because if you leave it stored too long, it'll torque specs will be off. But Actually, like technically, torque wrenches are supposed to be calibrated, or right? All your tool, like meteorology tools, are supposed to be uh, technically, but no one's going to do that. It's, mm. Just buy some fixed sticks. Like you can get online and get them. You can get online and build your own kit. You can get online and get certain kits. Like just have some sort of torque reading device and utilize the manufacturer specs. And just like the last video on rings and mounts, always read the optics manufacturer specs as well. Don't just like say this is a prime example. This is a twenty inch six arc. It's I wouldn't call it a build. We just kind of put together a pack. It's a package. That we put together in a store. Uh, this is Smith and Wesson. I always, I always want to call it something else, but it's Smith and Wesson uh, Volunteer in Six Arc. Now, the 16 inch version I have, and it shoots fantastic for a factory rifle. Now, I did ch- swap out the factory trigger, and it took probably like 150 rounds for it to really start shooting nice, but it shoots very nice. But this is the 20 inch version they have, and we went ahead and put together a little package here. Uh, Arca Rail Bipod, Amptain, Masterclass Bipod, Magpul. Uh, the PRS Gen 3 Lite from Magpul. Magpul uh, MOE XL whatever grip, the more vertical fat boy grip. And a Magpul Sling. Now, we paired it with the Strike Eagle 3 18 But to fall underneath a certain price point on this platform, we used the Alpha 3 mount from 6 Hour. Which, don't get me wrong. It's a great mount. They're not cheap or anything. They're like two something. I don't remember. Fantastic mount. The Alpha Three is a great mount for you know ARs. It is a cantilever mount. But as you'll find with a lot of mount and ring manufacturers nowadays, it's kind of becoming the new norm to print the specs on the the mounts or rings themselves, which I think it's great. What I don't like is if you're just unsuspecting customer and you don't you don't know any better. You buy the scope and this mount and everything else, and you torque this to 25 inch pounds because that's what it says on the SIG uh, Alpha 3 mount. You potentially could damage the scope because Vortex is just about all the time 18 inch pounds on their scope tubes. So always, 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 always read the optics manufacturer's torque specs and the ring you know, base manufacturer and all that. Now, what would you do if uh, the ring is calling for a higher torque spec than a... I'm always going to go air on the side of the optics manufacturer because, like, they know. Uh, they know more than anything, and they've probably tested all the different mounts and everything else. And anytime you can... Now, I don't always recommend this because, like, some of these companies make ugly mounts and everything else, but anytime you can match the mount to the optic, I would do so because it's the torque specs are going to be based off their own stuff. But like in this particular case, like uh, we didn't have a vortex one piece mount. And I also like the looks of the alpha three, six hour. Cause I think we can all agree, especially nowadays uh, aesthetics coming into the picture. Like they, they, they're important, but I would, I would go with the optics manufacturer. And if I, if I'm just like, I'm stuck, I just don't know what to do. Uh, call, or email both manufacturers because chances are like a, like an individual manufacturer such as Warren, uh, you know, they're not an optics company. They're a mount ring based company. Chances are they're going to know because they've probably done some testing. They're complaining about, Oh, you're doing a vortex, uh, go to 18 inch pounds. Like even though they're their little pamphlet on the inside of the box here may say like 20 or whatever, they're going to tell you like, Oh no, vortex go to 18 inch pounds. But also keep in mind, like, there's a reason why they started printing this information on the rings and bases, and there's a reason why optics manufacturers continue to get better about putting out information as far as, like, torque specs. It's because, like, if you talk to most optics manufacturers, the number one problem they have is improper mounting of said optic, whether it be 
too much torque crushing the tube affecting the internals or like not doing it promptly and allowing the optic itself to shift like there's all kinds of issues their number one thing their number one problem i guarantee if you caught all of them all of them would respond with the same answer in proper mounting so always use torque limited devices or reading devices whatever the case may be and utilize that information to give you which i, I can't there are certain things I will like uh, any kind of new range finder and stuff like that. I will usually like just pull out and try to figure it out. Cause I, cause to me that kind of falls on usability. Like, uh, you know, uh, you harp on a lot about Apple being really good at it. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, it's like intuitive design. Yes. Like I, that's what I, I really like doing first with any kind of new range finder, range finder binos, any kind of electronical device. I want to see how easy it is to figure it out on my own, but then I'll go back and read the owner's manual. But as it pertains to like mounts, scopes and everything else the first thing i typically do is read all the owner's manuals i want to know all the important information because like like if you just think you know how to uh re-zero the turret or whatever else like that you can potentially mess something up and i've done it in the past like years ago i was like oh i know what i'm doing and i messed up a it might have been a night force or something i don't remember i messed up something and after that i was like nope from here on out every single rings bases optics and all that stuff as soon as i open up i read through the owner's manual and while we're on the subject do the same with firearms uh read the owner's manual before you do anything like it's not it's not going to hurt nothing like they may have a particular uh, barrel break-in procedure they recommend they may recommend you to do something that you just never would have thought about and potentially could uh save you from messing something up i don't know like just read the owner's manual real fast and figure it all out like understand how things work like look at the owner's manual and look at the optic or look at the bases and rings and make sure you understand what you're doing before you start doing it uh it's not it's not that big of a deal like, it doesn't take that much time but anyways so you know once again use a torque device look at the specs printed with the optics and look at the specs printed with the mounting device or whatever the case may be like make sure you fully understand torque values and what you're doing and utilize these tools because if you mess something up and you didn't go by their manufacturing specs or you don't have in this day and age anybody who owns firearms at all i think should have some sort of kit and again going back to fix it sticks fix it sticks they're great they make little kits you can take that are easy to take with you like there's no reason why everyone at this point this day and age should there's no reason why everyone should have at least that bare essential kit from Fit Six Sticks uh, with the all in one torque limiter in their hunting bag or whatever the case may be. But that's just my opinion. Like, I don't, I just couldn't imagine not having certain things. <laughs> but moving on, uh, I think we kind of kicked that dead horse enough, like the importance of making sure you do those things. Let's move on to like, I think the next one would be probably height because that gets asked a lot. Like, what height should I run and everything else? And you're going to have, by today's standards, you're probably going to have certain heights, uh, 153 or, or thereabouts. Like there's going to be 1.54, you know. And then you're going to have a, like a 17 something, 170, 173, stuff like that. And then you're going to have like a 19. And nowadays you're going to get up into the twos. And it, it's gotten carried away. And this is the part of the first podcast I wish we would have had because like there was some pretty good little rants in there about this situation uh but we'll try our best to recreate that moment for you so yeah that's what i'm, I'm trying to remember because i don't know what like, i'm repeating from other podcasts to this yeah. one like this one this is a unity tactical which is a very aesthetically pleasing and uh, well-made mount but it's a 2.05 it's a tall boy oh i, I should have brought fish six in and mounted them up but anyways uh that's a tall mount. And now one of the biggest questions we get a lot of the time is which height. And for me, it's real simple for most hunting scenarios, LPVOs or optics that don't have a massive objective lens on ARs that this is the exception. I'll get to that here in just a second. ARs that just have like a very stereotypical, uh, non-adjustable cheek piece, uh, buttstock. Uh, for most hunting scenarios, a lot of people like the 154, 153, or whatever. Like this right here is that 154, I believe. Now, 
you know, it looks good. And your height overboard isn't going to be crazy, nothing too crazy. But the reality of the situation is you could have went with all the way up to that two-inch mount on this. Now, it's going to look goofy as shit with the 44-millimeter objective. But the good thing about these, like a stock like this, the PRS <clears throat> Gen 3 Lite or any of the PRS or B5 has some adjustable cheek pad stocks, is you do have adjustable cheek pad. Now, with the one... 5.3 mount, it's bottomed all the way out for me to utilize this optic. Now, and it's, I'm fine with that. But if I wanted to have some adjustability for like other shooters or if I wanted to get that recoil impulse a little bit lower, I would have went with like at least a 1.7 mount because on a 44 millimeter objective, like I don't want it to be absolutely atrociously ridiculous. And there is a certain point. As it pertains to like a platform like this, long range shooting where cheek weld is important and everything else, not like quick shooting where you can kind of, you know, slip the boat there on a good cheek weld or the heads up bullshit. And we'll get into that in just a second. But like a 173 would have probably been as tall as I went if I wanted to be able to utilize a little bit more adjustment out of the cheek pad. Because at a certain point, like there is a certain point of diminishing returns. Like I, I've played with this a lot on boat guns mostly to figure out okay regardless of what it looks like because to me like at a certain point this shit looks ridiculous like i don't know why it matters as much as it does to me but it does but at a certain point it's nice to have it elevated enough to where you can utilize up and down because what you'll find is you go down the rabbit hole of like shooting more precision style shooting like the difference between laying prone or or uh, shooting off certain kind of barricade and everything else, you may like a, a slight tweak in your uh, comb height. And giving yourself the ability to have enough room to adjust it is important. But there's also a big thing into uh, getting it a little bit higher over the bore line to where the recoil impulse is a little bit further down in your shoulder pocket. I guess, I don't know why they call it shoulder pocket, but whatever. You know, there, there's... Things to be said there, but most of the time we're not that worried about on ARs. But in this particular circumstance, you could potentially look at this one like a more of a precision style rifle. I mean, it's obviously set up that way, so maybe we should have went with a one seven three mount. But the one seven mounts we have, we put it in a different price category. So it's it's always pros and cons. Uh, but anyways. So, like, from a precision and hunting style shooting, like, most of the time you're going to get into is, like, 153s and 17s. And that's, unless you're trying to achieve something weird, uh, that's probably about, going to be about as high as I'd go, especially with a generic buttstock. Like, anything past a 17, there's going to be a massive gap between a buttstock and your, your, most people's cheek weld. Most people's. But from a tactical standpoint, this is where shit got a little carried away <laughs> like we got all these i said i wasn't gonna cuss in this one this is where like things got out of control and fitzy probably has a, a much deeper understanding of what they were doing i just find it hilarious when just because it's the cool and happening thing to do they'll they'll mount up a lpvl on like a two inch mount and then what do you see like a week later a goddamn cheek pad up here on the ar and it's like you could have just went with a one five three mount and had to you literally created the same scenario. And you know, keep in mind they don't have nothing underneath there like a laser or anything like that that they put it's just a thing, a look. <clears throat> yeah, and it seems a lot of people have moved away from the taller LPVOs, but in general, it all kind of started uh Jason Fala was a guy who kind of he really like I wouldn't say I don't I don't know if he's the specific guy who pioneered it, but he was kind of like big uh proponent of it back in the day is uh, running a higher, a, a taller mount. And essentially what you're trying to do is you, you keep the, you keep the optic height higher. So you're not, I mean, you remember like the tactical turtles, everybody yeah. can, like hunch over their gun. Yeah. Like, ridiculous. Well, thing. I mean, there, there's something to that because like, if you take a, I should have brought it, you know, I know I was going to say this should have brought another AR up here with a standard stock. You think you look at this AR now, traditional rifle stocks, Typically, there's a there's a like a swoop off because we're we're stuck in the past on that, and this is always going to be a complaint of mine. We're stuck in these traditional designs to where we used to run open sight rifles. So that obviously, in that 
particular situation, like this wouldn't work unless you had tall. That's why, like, that's why these sites on ARs are usually taller. It's because the the receiver, the handguard, and the buttstock, there usually isn't much height difference. Now, why I think that's great myself, because again, recoil impulses, it puts it further down and it allows you to do a lot with the platform as far as clip-ons and everything else. But from a tactical standpoint, and we're, you know, when he swapped into that, we're talking like a more of a tactical standpoint. It's not getting a good cheek weld and shooting precision groups or a, a coyote and eyeball at 200 yards or anything like that. We're talking about from a, a tactical standpoint where like, you know, generally speaking, when most red dots come out, there wasn't like a whole lot of rises or anything like that. Like you would end up having to bury your cheekbone into this, especially if you're like me, have high cheekbones, the way things used to be, uh, you'd have to bury your cheekbone in this to be able to get a good sight picture. So I can see where you'd want a taller mount on certain things. But where I disconnect, my brain just disconnects as an LPVO. Now, I know like the LPVO, like the it's purpose-driven, but it's, it seems to me like it's more purpose-driven towards, I want to be able to identify engaged targets at much further ranges, and I might go CQB. Whereas a red dot's going to be CQB within a hundred yards. Yeah. Well, they were playing around with both of it because they were using it as like, you know, because you do have that nice one X, but yeah, it's very specific, like groups that were doing this in in all like CQB environments. And so it's, it's so much more about like the body mechanics and positioning. And there is, so I played the work because I, you know, I don't want to just like willy nilly go out there and talk about things like most people do. I played with this. I played with different height mounts and uh, just shooting like steel up close CQB type stuff with some of my other guns. Uh, there is a difference between say, if like you just have like a, just a red dot mounted directly on the receiver with a generic stock. And then you swamp to like a red dot with some sort of riser. I don't know what the, like the, the most generic riser on red dot is nowadays, probably one seven something. Something like that. Uh, like nowadays, I don't even remember. There is a huge difference in that. But at a certain point, it yeah, becomes a little bit way. negligible, in my opinion, which it's also going to be very much dependent on your damn cheek well. Like, or if you're throwing out, it's, 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 it's so multifaceted. There's a, yeah, your lower one. Th- okay, so you had absolute. You, the, mainly back in the day, you had absolute co witness and lower one third. Lower one third. It's not. There's not an exact number because it varies from manufacturer, but it's like anywhere from one five zero to one seven zero, and that was seen as like you know it's more or less standard height. Yeah. See, you know, when I played with this, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, I think, maybe a month ago. I don't remember now. When I played with this, I found that I didn't like anything directly on it. I didn't like anything over like I think it was one one seven. Anything which is also my like I have highest cheekbones and I do to me I place more importance on getting every single time I I uh I guess you would call drive the rifle the same. Like I place a lot of importance on that in any kind of practice. Uh I found it way easier with my cheekbones, and that's where this is most important. That that one five one seven was super easy, and I wasn't like ducked over. You know, you know what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Like yeah. for the people out there just listening, I, we sometimes we forget that they can't see what we're doing. <laughs> but you know, I think I think uh, at a certain point it's ridiculous when you start adding on cheek risers to your stock. You probably just bought the wrong damn mount. Well, and again, you you see they moved away from that particular LPVOs because it's it's kind of it's gone to a further extreme with like a red dots or EOTEX where they're doing like almost a three inch uh, height, height sign. And it's, again, it's literally so like you like from a standing position, like you can get the gun up as quickly as possible. Right. And again, you're not at one point where you just not even put a saddle on it and just work off of laser only from the waist. Yeah. Like Vietnam. That, well, that's where the, that's where the tricky part and that's where the night vision stuff gets in. Cause yeah, you know, everybody was using lasers before, but now like when you uh, consider like near peer conflicts, uh, you know, other enemies have now, I mean, you're not shooting goat herders in the middle East. Other enemies have the capability to see IR. Yeah. 
And so there's another, there's a different wavelength of IR, but then, you know, the, the meme has become, well, I'm going to call it a meme. The, you know, the shtick on, on the internet has become to shoot passively. So like, how do you have, you know, uh, night vision on and look through a red dot without, while also shooting right. in that, like, I guess right. I would call it a more neutral stance. I, it's all stupid. <laughs> it's okay. Boomer. It, it is. It's. I don't, I just don't understand why certain, so many people get like so twerked off on this. Guess what? Most people like doing all the bitching, complaining and you know, all the know-it-alls. Most of them don't even shoot very much because most people doing the things are out there doing the things. I say for the sake of this con, this podcast, uh, we're talking about hunting today. So my opinions are as a hunter, if you're putting together a hunting rifle or you know we talk about this some too like if you if you're going to utilize your home defense rifle for some predator hunting up close uh just try some different mounts and figure out what works yeah. best for you i mean hog hunting do whatever the fuck you want nobody gives a shit uh, brain, brain. the but you know again the use case is different so with hunters what like everybody's just trying to maximize like how do i get the fly to shooting yeah. cartridge and you know you might, I, I don't know, I would hope everybody would realize this, but you know, the height of your optic plays a very important role in like yeah. your zero and where it crosses over and everything else. Maximum point blank range. And, you know, we, we talked about this last time, like used to, from a predator hunting standpoint before ARs were like highly used in this game, uh, on boat guns, like which I still recommend it for a predator hunting boat gun, is mm -hmm. get the... I don't run anything. I try not to even run 50 millimeter objectives because I want the lowest rings possible. Because again, most stocks suck. They don't have adjustments in the cheek pad, and you need to get that optic as close down as possible so I can get a good cheek bone because I have high cheekbones. But back in the day, it was even more important. It's like if you've seen, like back in the day, predator hunting rifles, Leopold Lily made a scope that curved around your barrel to decrease that gap and meaning like the maximum point blank range just keep in mind on ar platform the taller you go with these mounts the more that's going to be different like especially for predator hunting where a lot of times where ars are used is like closer quarter stuff yeah you know you could use it for longer range stuff but a lot of times like you see these people running them on thermals for pig hunting and predator hunting in closer thick country so just keep in mind, like the higher you sling the optic, whatever it may be, off of the rifle, that's like your thirty yard zero is going to be something weird. But you can you can get through all of that if you just know what your rifle does. Yeah, and but you the, shoot. But the high, like again, if you exaggerate it, the higher you go, like on an LPVO, because that's really one of the nice things about the AR is it has pretty good and easy rememberable, you know, uh, holdovers. You know what, you know the fifty two hundred or the. Like it t depending on the air, it tends to line up pretty well. Well, nowadays it's well for, and that's more for I would say quote unquote combat accuracy right. depending on a person, maybe not necessarily environment. Nowadays there's so many different barrel lengths, there's so many different calibers and everything else. It's kind of like, but it, it it is easy, and I said it in that one podcast. It doesn't matter the caliber, anything that's not just completely like a three arm blackout. No, I'm not, this is not what I'm saying about that. But like anything, I'm gonna say. 14 and a half inch and longer up to 18 inch, 20 inch, whatever zero to 500 yards. If you have a place to shoot, you don't even have to know nothing about ballistics. You just need to shoot enough to know what that's going to do in certain winds and everything else. And then that, that's five, five, six as well. Like it's not that hard to engage human sized targets. Now, when you start talking about predator hunting or your targets like fox hunting, those targets get pretty small, but typically speaking, a lot of that target engagement is going to end up being very close. So if you have a freaking two, two inch mount on an LPVO and you're shooting a lot of Fox at 30 yards, you better practice enough or just zero the son of a bitch at 30 yards. Like, but also just keep in mind, if you do zero to 30 yards, like your hundred yards, zero and stuff is going to be a little bit crazy and wonky. It all can be solved by doing the practice. It's crazy. But anyways, Moving on. I mean, again, I, you know, a one a one five in that range on an optic. Again, LPVOs can get a little weird, but 
It, 150 is pretty much standard. Yeah. Like you're not going to screw yourself going with the 150. If you want something a little taller or 17 on a yeah. LPVO. I wouldn't recommend anything over 17 for anything predator hunting related. Uh, we're talking about daytime optics. Now, now that the thermals are coming to where you use, you know, scope mounts and stuff like that, like that's a whole different talk for a different day. But we're talking about like glass optics, like LPVOs or, you know, Com- more compact objects such as this like that's primarily what we're speaking to because a lot of things can change when you start changing up the, the name of the game completely but 100 like most of the most of the time most people one five or one seven like that's kind of just going to be where you live like that's going to cover you for most things you're going to want to do with predator hunting or hunting or whatever rig uh where where i'm going to lean harder into one set the one sevens is is if if you are, again, it, a lot of it depends on your cheekbone setup, I guess. But if you are kind of into, like, the tactical stuff, which I'm totally fine with. Like, I think it's great that people, because you're getting a lot of crossover because of ARs and all that kind of stuff. And guys are going out hunting pigs and everything else. I think it's great. I think it's great that you would have a home defense rifle next to your bed. With like a say it has an LPVO on it or whatever, and you know spare me the bullshit. I don't care. Like you can debate what's best for home defense, but if you have an AR that has an LPVO on it and it's more compact than everything else, I urge people to get out and use it in predator hunting in the close quarter stuff because it does two things. One, you get some trigger time on that rifle because I guarantee you most people this probably happens way too much, which is kind of scary. They have some sort of home defense weapon, pistol, shotgun, rifle, whatever. And we can debate another day what would be the best, which I think would be fun with other people. Uh, but they have a home defense AR with an LPVO on it or something like that, and they never get out and use it. And this is like, that's, to me, that's a scary thought. Like My home defense platforms, I shoot at least once every two weeks if I'm super busy. If I can, I shoot them every single week the pistols and the rifles like i i want to be squared away on that i want to know it's functioning properly and it's cleaned up all the time and all that stuff like because chances are nothing's ever going to happen but in, in the case of that one time something happening i want to be proficient at it because not only like it, it, you could potentially put your own family's life in danger if you suck at shooting that rifle but i said all that to say this like that's the one in, instance I would recommend maybe a one seven for that more heads up awareness type bullshit. But again, like, you know, maybe that's another discussion for another day, but moving on. I mean, I think we covered that the, the height pretty well, uh, moving on to different types and our favorite brands. Obviously the stuff you see on the table here is going to, I've tested all of it. I own all of it. I use all of it. I like certain ones for certain things. Um, and we'll cover all that, like some of my favorite brands and everything else. And, uh, obviously all this stuff we carry in the store, you know, we try to carry stuff that's been tested and embedded that work well. And they do, most of them do, do something a little bit different or whatever, you know, do, do, do. <laughs> so I think my favorite no frills mount like, I don't need it to do nothing other than hold an optic. It is the Sig Sauer Alpha 3s. They're super lightweight. They're great mounts. Uh, they do everything I want them to do, and that's it. Like, uh, you know, very simple. They use half-inch nuts like a bunch of them still do. Uh, the top is probably a T15, if I recall correctly. And if you have those two tools uh, in a kit with you, you can fix it on the field if, or, you know, if anything were to rise or whatever like that. Uh, going past that... My favorite for, I, th- I'm so I'm so, you know what? All of them are my favorites. How about that? I'm just gonna stop using that because they're all my favorites. But one of my favorites, and I wish they would come out with more accessories already, is the Reptilia stuff. So it's very, it's very Badger ish, like with its look and everything. And they also have the little slots here, like Badger mounts do for accessories but you don't see any accessories for this that i'm aware of reptilia takes a different approach with their uh 
I, it's it's te- the technical phrase still is windage screws, but I still don't understand that. But whatever. Uh, the technical phrase is windage screws, like basically the part that holds it on to the rifle. They take a different approach. They do a more slicked off version, and there is, from a hunting standpoint, there is validity to that. Like because I have hung shit on these going through the brush, these big old honking half inch nuts. But at the same time, I kind of like that of simplicity in case you need to repair something in the field. But what Reptilia does is they made it to where it takes a T... T25, I'm pretty sure. T25 or a flathead. So that kind of that kind of fixes that situation because let's just say like for whatever reason this shit came loose on you, you didn't even have a flathead. You probably got something you can get in there. Yeah, pretty... Maybe even the, the base of a cartridge. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but... And they do... This is what I like the most about them. The torque specs are on the side, in case you forget, because most of them are printed somewhere where you can't see them. Uh, Reptilia has started coming out with some accessories. As you see here, this one is, what is it? This RMR, I don't know what all these mounts, yeah. uh, uh, RMR mount on yeah, top. Yes, so replaceable top caps. Uh, they were they also have one that, well, the, the replaceable top cap, you can either, I think you can either buy the top cap or you can buy a complete setup to where you can actually mount it on the optic and yeah. turn it 45, which, in my opinion, I'd rather have it over here. That's just what I like, you know, that quick tilt. But anyways, uh, these are very nice mounts. And they, they're not cheap, you know. But one quick thing, and we covered it a lot more in depth. I don't know if we should, like, whatever. So as far as the mounting apparatus itself, uh, if you're buying an AR mount, this is just my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. If you're buying a one-piece AR mount, cantilever mount is the appropriate verbiage, I believe. And it doesn't have some sort of lug here, I wouldn't even buy it. Like, if, it, if we're solely, and I know these will act as lugs. But I also like the added benefit of having these lugs. Like, the chances of anything moving whatsoever are even more reduced when they add more lugs in here. Now, for those just listening, it's essentially you flip the mount over and there's your two bolts, I guess, is what holds it on and slides into the Picatinny slots. But also there's an extra lug there to hold it still. Because we talked about this more and I wish you could remember everything you said. Yeah, it's more or less. It's like mounting... The cantilever, and I'll wait. You know what? I'll say this to, when we start talking about mounting the optic. But anyways, uh, lug, I want lugs on mine, and if they don't have lugs, I don't buy that mount. It's really that simple. But anyways, uh, Reptilia, look at them, check them out. They're they they most of my daytime rigs that are strictly like shorter range platforms, I will run Reptilia because I'm going to try and keep everything like I'll run smaller charging handles all like. I look at it, it's crazy. This always comes up. I look at it from this perspective. How can I produce the best tool for the job? In my short range, thick brush stuff, I keep all that in mind. Which cantilever mount isn't going to be crazy on snag points? Accessories on the rifle. How do I reduce any snag points for going to the brush and stuff like that? How do I reduce weight? Because typically when I'm doing like, Thick stuff calling. I'm doing a lot of work on foot. I'm I'm making shorter in times, you know, shorter time stands and also shorter distances between. So I'm using way way less volume. So I'm keeping it lightweight, it's the most snag proof as possible, and just simplify everything because it's a short range. I'm running a you know a lower powered a lower powered LPBO like a one to six or you know what have you. And there will be probably some sort of offset red dot. So Reptilia got you covered. You got a couple of different options. And uh, if Reptilia, if you're listening to this, hurry up and come out with more 35 millimeter options. And the little badger, I'm going to call this a badger hole. I don't know what, you know, it's on Reptilia and badger. You have these little holes underneath the rings themselves that kind of on the base of the mount. And it's for the J arm accessories on the badger mounts, but the badger mount accessories don't fit in these holes which I hate. I can kind of understand why they would do that, but also at the same time, it's like I would probably make my stuff accessible to other stuff, meaning 
I'd want the Badger J Arm stuff to fit mine unless I had a full line of J Arm esque accessories out. Like if I I don't know, you know, I'm sure they had the reasons for not doing it. Reptilia is a fantastic product, very aesthetically pleasing, very nice. I've never had one issue out of them, uh, and I have multiple of them. Moving on. Uh, see, I covered, yeah, six hour alpha threes, great mount. Reptilia, great mount. Probably go to uh, the Badger next. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, well, I mean, before I get into because Badger's a little bit longer conversation, I'll go ahead and speak on. Can you see that or I need to get it? Which one specifically? The Night Force. Hey, you can see it. So at the very front of the table, you're going to see like a night vision bridge or, or a bridge type thing in yeah, the very, very, very front right. mount is the night force mount uh i mean nice mount have the torque specs printed on it i mean and you can utilize the uh what do you call that diving board i don't diving you can board, utilize yeah. their diving board on their mount and i don't know about i don't you know i don't run a lot of night force rings and bases anymore but i do have some and i've never had any issues out of them yeah, it's just a basic no frills mount yeah and it is pretty lightweight i'll give them that it is again aesthetically pleasing it's fd or tanned eyes brown eyes dark earth eyes whatever you want to call that i don't know how their accessories are i don't know if they do any kind of offset stuff or anything like that like i just don't follow it but uh you do have that option for like that uh diving board type thing to mount on that mount it works with the rings or the mount i'm pretty sure because I have that on my some scope rings, but I don't have that on my mount from them. But anyways, uh, I don't know how their aftermarket accessorizing goes. But uh, like a no frills, probably good quality, lightweight. I mean, chances are if you're buying a Night Force, you might. It's probably the I would say one of the few times you're probably going to wind up with a Night Force mount. Um, right, because like you know you don't see them a lot of places like you do the Badger and everything else. Uh, but anyways. Moving on, um, and while we're you know covering this, we'll go ahead and cover QD real fast. I don't use but one QD mount, and it's just like the one sitting right over there, American Defense mount. And I, I can't speak to QD mounts whatsoever. I haven't ran enough of them. I don't, I don't want to run enough of them because it's kind of to me it's pointless. It's a moog point because like you have to get those set just right. In order to work now if you just have correct tools and place your mount in the same place every time it's going to return to zero if you've done everything properly and you don't have a shit scope and how quick is a half inch nut or a flat flathead screwdriver is it any slower than a qd mount like <laughs> well yeah there was a, uh, nowadays i don't see the point in them Back then, I did. There's like this fantasy land that people live in where they're going to be in the middle of combat, like behind cover, and their scope breaks for whatever reason. They're like, well, God, thank God I can throw this lever and put on my other scope mount. I think... Uh, well, what you see in the hunting field is there's still a lot of people... There's a lot of people ask me about them. I'm just like, I don't know. I, just, I don't mess with them. Like, it's pretty quick to do it the other way. But there's still a lot of people who will, especially on ARs, they'll take their daytime optic off yeah, and slap on the thermal. Which is fine. I mean, I'm I'm good with that. But, but are you gonna have like? I no, always. You're not gonna be like at your truck. You're not gonna have like. Yeah, no. I always, I always go back to like how, how much faster is that really? Because it's. I mean, if you to me, if you put the QD mount on tight enough. It almost takes a tool to flip the levers back out. Yeah. And maybe I don't have, again, well, I have they, zero experience with these. I just have one kind, and it's an American. I've had a bunch of American times. Defense. Yeah, that's an ADM. Um, and, like, I get it so tight, I have to use a screwdriver to flip the levers out. <laughs> the, again, I, for toolless, I think that's the concept, like, toolless in the field, but it's, you know, I'm I always going to have some, some always going to have some tools. Uh, that's just me. <laughs> Just, like if it's a good mount, like it doesn't. It's not a negative that it's cutie to me. It's just no. Uh, it's just right. To me, it's more shit to deal with. I'd just rather turn two half inch nuts or a T twenty five. Yeah. Well, I think that kind of comes back that we, we covered this a little bit last time is because that's always the question is like return to zero repeatability, and it, it comes so much more down to the process of installing the mount than it does necessarily the mount yeah. itself. If you do everything properly. 
past that and you have a good quality mount, and I think that needs to be emphasized, having a good quality mount. Because there is shit out there. If you have a good quality mount, you do everything properly. And do it consistently do every time. Is make like some sort of witness marks, little paint marker. A black marker that you can only see in certain light. Like if you're that worried about a black mark being on your optic or your your AR upper or something like that. Like there's ways that you can make little marks to where if you do pull off your optic fairly often, just make sure you redo the process the same every single time. And it's to me like how much more QD quick disconnect is a half inch nut or a T25. It's pretty quick, but you know, sorry, I just don't mess with those kind of mounts very often. And I do have quite a few of those American defense. I don't have any issues out of them. I don't love them, but I don't hate them. Like it's, you know, as far as like how they look, how they go together. Cause the, I don't know if they have anything different nowadays, but a lot of the American defense, uh, basically the rings and for the people that are just listening, sorry, but for the rings, they come together, uh, not even like a clamshell. They don't open up. Like you physically can pull them completely off and put them on, uh, Hey, I don't know. I don't know what to say on cutie. Uh, everything's cutie. <laughs> everything's quick. Yeah. Quick to attach if you're fast. Exactly. Uh, so moving on to, uh, I'm saving Badger for the last, because it's probably my favorite right now because of the accessories. Uh, the Moving on to the Warren Precision Mount. Now, this is the Warren Precision Cantilever Mount, because they have a, Warren Precision bolt gun mount. I don't remember exactly. It may just be the Warren Precision mount, but it's the Warren Precision can lever mount. Again, this is one of those systems that's going to be. It's going to have uh, give you the ability to put accessories on. Now, I would I would uh, lean this towards like this. They are American made company. I have several of these. I've never had any issues out of them uh, whatsoever. I like them. I wish they'd make some changes on stuff, but whatever. I can say that about any of these people. So, so, you know, on the table here, some of the accessories that you can put on the precision mount. Now, for a Predator Hunter, obviously the dope card holder, you could run it. Uh, it does fold up out of the way. Like if you want to put your drops or whatever for daytime hunting. But there's also like little Picatinny rails. Now, if you're running like a scope like this, the Picatinny rail may not be as much help to you because there's no extension like you'll see like on a diving board type uh, mounts. They're just flat rails that you can mount on the side or on the top. But do you have a level that you can mount on it uh, as far as like leveling your scope for long range shooting? Uh, the ability the ability is there for, to accessorize the mount to carry other stuff. Uh, not quite as much, in, the, in my opinion, not quite as good as options as, say, a Badger mount, but it still is a good option for like a precision style thing because that's it's kind of what it's more centered around is like a precision shooting style mount like we would have done it on this rifle kind of because this is like set up for like a precision style shooting platform but uh, we already have one out there that has a per one precision mount so that's kind of where we went a different direction on this one but good option uh good mounts again i've never had any issues out of it uh they're on the picatinny rails that you can add on to the mount there is a 90 degree and there's a zero degree. Now you can't take the zero degree and put it at a 90 and you can't take the 90 and put it at a zero because the screws are different lengths. So keep that in mind if you buy that system. So moving on to my favorite currently, now this, this is a subject change. Any moment. <laughs> and it, there are more mounts out there. Uh, this isn't just what's all available. This is what I've tested personally. This is what we carry in the store. And this is what I can recommend based off of actual experience in the field. Badger mount. Now, if you'll split, ugh. currently, in my opinion, they are doing the best about accessories for your mount, your one piece mount. Now, you know, if you're just mounting the scope and you don't care about accessories, then, you know, this doesn't apply to you. But, uh, my opinion, uh, they are doing the best. Now, there's several different accessories available. I don't even think we have them all. I think there's a, angle indicator as well and you know there's obviously different types of stuff that but we have representation of it but anyways so the badger mount is very reminiscent of the and i didn't even talk about the geisley the geisley mount no, let me just go ahead and grab it yeah this was kind of the beginning of a first of all 500 optic mounts that 
So didn't didn't they uh, didn't they kind of like? Yes, the, their thing was they kind of were obviously going after military contracts. This was right as LPVOs were kind of gaining, po- or the Vortex One Six was gaining popularity, and they uh, they took they took an interesting approach in the design and the machining of it, uh, which you see a lot more these days. To where you know, at the time in the very beginning, they were actually fitting like you could buy an optic specifically for like a you know Vortex One to Six on an AR Fifteen. They have different one for you know three hundred eight ARs. Yeah, and they would actually almost they would customize the uh, the cap, serialize like, the and, caps. Well, yeah, yeah they serialize the caps because they actually they bore them and then they cut them with the jeweler saw. They cut the caps off. Uh, but then the, they would actually, the, the ring cap distance would be like set for the scope. Cause you know, you run into that sometimes you get a scope mount and it doesn't fit on the damn scope you have. And so that was, you know, at least in the AR world, let's see before that, everybody was obsessed with QD, you know, obviously LaRue, like the LT104 classic. Um, you also see, you should see a lot of two piece cantilever mounts back then. Yeah, I didn't as much, but, um, you know, like LaRue at one point was the gold standard. And it seemed like it really after the Geisley mount, like people were okay with like, oh, it's not quick to attach. Because again, they realized I'm not going to be like. A half inch nuts pretty quick. Well, I'm not going to be behind. I'm not going to be in combat. I'm not going to pull out my screen. assassin's bag and change yeah. my optic out in the field. Uh, but, you know, um, yeah, we forgot to mention it, but uh, Geisley super precision now. Uh, no accessorizing there, but it is a fantastic mount. Well, there there are accessories. That's kind of how Reptilia got their starts. They made uh, they made it. Oh yeah, that's cap. right. We talked about that too. Top well, caps. No th- first party accessories there. Yeah. It's just it's really good standard mount. Um, yeah, very well built. Little heavy. Yes. Well, I wouldn't. Maybe maybe like more. It's more bulky than heavy. It's probably fair to say. But uh, sorry, I had a text from Marcus. Uh, and, you know, get, you know, bad uh, guys are great. Badger, my current favorite. I wish it was a little bit lighter, but whatever. Like it's probably not even that. It's probably a neg- negligible amount of heavier than say a reptilian. It may not even be heavier. Just a lot of stuff when you start getting in like these lightweight things, appearances mean a lot it's like it's, it seems bulkier so maybe my mind my mind's telling me it's heavier but anyway it's badger mount so again another fantastic mount i wish they would move the location of the torque specs on the side but that's just kind of like a nitpicky pet peeve of mine but two locking lugs on the bottom of the mount fantastic half inch nuts t15 for the caps a uh, very very nice mount badger ordnance makes fantastic products but anyways Badger Ornitz, in my opinion, from what I've seen, is probably doing the best about accessorizing because they're paying attention to what people are doing. Now, now that they have their bolt gun mounted, it's important on a couple of things to make sure you're buying the right accessory, but a lot of these will interchange. So first and foremost, these little slots here underneath the actual ring itself is for the J-arm accessories. And uh, there's a level, there's a J-arm mount, there's an angle indicator, and there may be something else, but I don't remember. But with the J-arm, which is this guy right here, you can place this anywhere you want, you know, either side or front or back. And there is two different – you said there's two different angles? Yeah, uh, depending on – because they make it for different heights. Uh, I forget the exact degrees. Now, once you have your J-arm, you can then mount uh, different bases to it for different red dots and – stuff of that nature. And there's also different heights on the actual dot mount. So lots of accessories available for that standpoint. Now, this isn't just like, don't, don't kid yourself. These aren't just for LPVOs. Like if you're going to run if this rifle that I just took off the table, you're going to run a three to 18 for a predator hunting thing. Cause you're mostly in open country. I highly recommend an offset red dot for predator hunting. Cause like, that 3X and, it, you know, God forbid it be a uh, first focal plane and you don't have your illumination turned on. Like a lot of modern reticles, you're not going to be able to see hardly anything on 3X uh, as far as your reticle goes. So anything up close that busts in on you, which happens quite often in predator hunting, could be a bit of an issue. But if you just have an offset red dot or even a roof, I, call, I guess you'd call that a roof mounted red dot, quick target acquisition. 
touch off on them. Like it's to me, it's a no brainer for anything, especially ARs. And even on some boat guns, I'd recommend, like, even if you're a staunch boat gun shooter, I would recommend an offset red dot. If you're going to be predator hunting, cause you never know what it, like, even if it just came in handy one time, it paid for itself right there in my opinion. But anyways, that's the cool thing about the JR is there's multiple different for myself, it puts it at the right angle for that to rock it over and run the red dot, but you can also run it on the top. I don't get that in a minute, but the J arm tons of different, uh, I think I'm sure they make it for all of them, you know, at this point, uh, all the different red. Uh, yeah. It'll course. cover a lot of them, you know, uh, get you a good offset red dot. You can put it for aft on the actual mount here, back or front. Uh, fantastic system. The fantastic products. I've never once had any quality control or anything break or anything like that. Badger mounts. You know, I own quite a few of them. Uh, going to the top cap. So you will need, and this is important, you will need the correct top count, top cap for, I want to get the full name of this bad boy. Do you remember what it is? Make sure I get it right. This is a Badger Condition 1 mount. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry. I was. I didn't know which part because specifically you were talking about. That is important. Because they have old... Their, Badger <laughs> has their old unit mounts. Yeah. The Condition 1 system is the system that takes all the accessories. But there's two different versions of it now. Which you'll get there's a the bolt gun one. That also has the Condition 1 name. But there's also something different there. Now, we're talking about the top caps right now. Because it's important to know. The condition one mount takes this one right here for your top cap. Like it's a, it's essentially almost like a Lego esque Lego Lego yes esque system. Like not only do they bolt together, they snap together almost. Like they they have different slots that fit together, which I think that's the correct way to do these types of things. This is called the Badger One, uh, Badger One, Badger Ordnance Condition One. It says arc. Is that correct? You might want to double check this. Yeah, I think it is. Condition one, badge ordinance condition one arc. Yeah, accessory ring cap. That's what the arc Boom. Is. So you'll notice here for you the those who are watching, on this cap, there's two holes that are, you know, evenly spaced apart, and then there's one that's pushed way forward. This is for the AR mount, the Badger Ordnance, blah, blah, Badger Ordnance Condition One mount. Look at the holes, because this has already happened to a few people. Look at the holes; they're not evenly spaced. There's three holes on the top cap; they're not evenly spaced. The Badger One, Badger Ordnance, God, no, they just didn't change the name. The Badger Ordnance One Max is the new bolt gun mount, and you may check. Like if I said that right, but the cap has three holes, just like the other one, but they're all evenly spaced apart. Now I'm talking about the holes where the screws go to screw the cap down to the mount, not the two holes in the very top. And we'll get to that in just a second, but it's important to know, like you need this mount, the condition one max accessory ring cap, which I guess would be max arc <laughs> M arc. Mark, uh, it is for the bolt gun mount. The other one is for the AR mounts. Now, why are these important? This is just like the J arm. This is the base from which you will build upon, essentially. Uh, and you can go to a couple different routes for it, uh, routes with it. Uh, one being you can mount, do some sort of top mount such as this. Uh, so like the reptilia replaces that camp with a flat to like that particular optics mount, which mm, arguably you should probably go with some sort of system like the badger where the badger gives you your top cap, your base, your platform. And then they give you little caps that go on top of it for different optics. But the biggest thing for like most predator hunters, why they would move to this system, why I use this system is for the diving boards. Isn't that what it's called? Cliff. Yeah. So the cliffs. Now, any cliff will fit on either or the boat gun or the AR mount, but you have different length options, 12 slot, 9 slot, and I think there's a 7 slot. 
But if like you're always going to be mounting a light on top of your optic or a range finder or anything of that nature, these are pretty handy. Uh, I use I run them on quite a few rifles, so it's it's a great. I I love modularity in all things. It's a great modular system, well proven. Yes, this shit costs money. I mean, you can, if you do an offset red dot, uh, uh, cliff, and all that kind of stuff, like you could be tied up in your mount quite a bit of dollars. But at the end of the day, like this is what I don't get about some people. You, you you find this on all things. Like sometimes, most of the time, it's the optic. Everybody's you know goes cheap on the optic. Uh, if you, the the mount. In my opinion, it's even more important because, like, it doesn't matter how expensive the rifle is, how expensive the optic is. If you put it in some bullshit or cheap ass mount that, that won't work properly, then you're just spinning your wheels. Yeah, if you're gonna put a Porsche on some shitty tires, it's not gonna be very good. So, don't be as scared to spend a little bit of money on your mounts. Like, you want something that's good, high quality, looks good, you know, uh, has proven track record of being good product. Not just some bullshit from Academy that's like Chinese, cheap Chinese crap that's never going to work right, and you're, you're probably going to blame the scope. But those, you know, those are my main picks. And I, if I had to choose one for a better hunter, if you're going to do any kind of accessorizing to your optic, Badger Ordnance right now gets my vote. Now, there are there are more out there. I just don't have experience with them, so I'm not going to speak on them. Uh, so, I mean, past that... Uh, there was something we were going to circle back around to. What was it? Oh, mounting it? No, we already talked about that, didn't we? No, no. You already, I think you already covered it. We were talking about, uh, it was about the, it was about the, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't remember now. You know, that's, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good product available nowadays. Yeah. The main thing, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think you need to look for is, again, like, you can go with something like the, you know, like a Night Force if, just want a basic mount or like the SIG. Mm-hmm. If you think you're long term going to want some accessories like the diving board or the cliff for mounting a rangefinder, or like you you mentioned in the last podcast, a lot of predator hunters like to mount their lights off there. Yeah, so that's another option there. Yeah, you know, there's still like I said, well, I mean, even the guys running night vision or something like that, or uh, these thermals, you know. I don't understand why you don't see more of this. And when I did it a few times, people acted like I reinvented the wheel. For the guys going out with some of the newer thermals, like some of the new pulsars that will take, like, uh, you know, regular mounts or, you know, scope rings, stuff like that. I don't understand why. And I still have quite a few rifles set up for like, like this. I understand why you don't see them utilizing more mounts that allow, like, offset red dot and run a light as a backup, like, or if you're going to retrieve an animal, you're probably going to be using a flashlight at some point, you know, on certain nights. Uh, or if you kind of, you know, want to give your eyes a rest from looking through a thermal, having an offset red dot and a light on that AR could be very handy for like a quick dispatch or something like that. Or if God forbid you're in, and I'm sure this happens to people, you're in the middle of a stand and there's cow like right on top of you and your battery goes dead or, or something happens. Having the ability having the mount or even if you don't have that style of thermal and you have a generic thermal, or whatever, I'd still want to offset red dot and light on my thermal rifle setup, but that's just me. I, I like redundancies. Uh, and I'm, I would, you know, I would eat that little bit of increased weight just to have those few things on my rifle as a backup, uh, or again, for going and retrieving animals. Like I have a gun, uh, I have a couple shorties that I use for this very specific reason. Excuse me. Uh, when we're on big ass ranches and we're just kind of, you know, whether the calling was slow or whatever the case may be, we might just get in the truck and just ride around and look through the thermal, count deer and all that kind of stuff. But if we see a cow, we're going to shoot it. So I will set up a truck gun with more, I don't care about thermal performance above everything else. I want something that's good short range because I'm not going to hold the gun up while I'm driving. I'm going to have a handheld, a good quality handheld scanner. So I will take a truck gun, which is usually like something that's 14 inches or shorter. Um, I usually want to put a little bit bigger suppressor because I am shooting from the truck. And again, folks, I'm not doing this from the highway. We're talking about massive ranges here, but anyways, I will go a little bit cheaper on the thermal 
as long as it holds zero and I can quickly throw up and shoot it and it has good battery life, I'm good. That's where the SIG Echo 3 comes into play. And I've used some other smaller, lighter weight, cheaper ones, but I'm going with light as weight possible, short, compact, and I don't really care so much about the performance because I've already already know what I'm shooting via my good higher dollar handheld thermal. But what I will do is do a good offset red dot and have a flashlight on it. Because from the pickup, or like when we're doing drive-bys, chicken cattle, or whatever the case may be, I'm not trying to do no long-range plinking or anything like that. I'm going to quickly throw up and shoot. And that's where, even if I had like a little pulsar that uses a, we can, we can use a one-piece mount or whatever the case may be, I'm going to have that uh, offset red dot and flashlight set up. Because some cases, like if it's that close to the truck, I'm just going to click online and use the red dot. I'm not even going to try and look through the thermal. I'm not going to try and mess with some kind of focus or anything like that. I'm going to tilt that bad boy over, click on light shoot. Like that's, but anyways, uh, you know, I, you know, I, th- I think it's just more important. Like people, like people are more, definitely more open to spending money on better things nowadays. It seems as they used to. But it's still, I, I see it a lot. Like someone will have a really nice rifle, really nice optic, and have it in forty dollars rings. So it just drives me nuts because I'm like, well, I bet you've had some trouble with your scope because like you got it in some garbage. Uh, just spend money on mounts. It's 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 like you said. Like it's like having a sports car on some bullshit tires. You know, it's I don't know. It's it's it, it everything matters. If you want, it's like putting a putting a wing and an exhaust on your Honda Civic. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that kind of wraps up like my favorites. Uh, I don't really have any honorable mentions in this category because uh, nowadays I just try to get like good quality shit. Like, again, I, I realized that a long time ago. Like I would spend all this time trying to make shitty rings better back in the lapping days, or and, and I was just like, oh, you should just buy better shit. Well, it also was a little bit like back then, I just didn't know where to go get good shit. But while we're on the subject of LPVL's mounts, I want to talk about this one right here. This is the Trigicon VCOG. Uh, for those uninitiated, this is actually what the Marines use. Is the Marines? Ooh, they adopted this one, didn't they? I'm pretty sure they did. So, is that on the M27 IAR, I think? So, I mean, this one is made in the USA because they had to do it for the contract reasons of military. And it is, you know, my personal opinion, it's kind of ugly. This, with this, their little cover or whatever this is, like, I don't, I don't, like the rubberized coating or whatever you want to call this. Like, it's, it's, it's battlefield, you know, stuff, I guess. But the glorious thing about this this is also my biggest pet peeve about optics mounts in general is I think the whole entire system is stupid and we should be working towards standardizing and stuff like that to figure out a better mounting system. The glorious thing about this is that it is built in to the optic. Yeah, so this and is I good, freaking love that about it. Yeah, it's a big conversation we had <laughs> yeah. when we tried to film this the first time is, you know, having a round object that clamps onto another round object and a thing that has horizontal recoil is probably not the best <laughs> design. Now, it's as stupid as it is, it's probably the best design when you balance the factors yeah. of having to have variable optic height, having to have variable eye relief. Yeah. But as, you know, we've kind of unified a lot of like modern arms mm-hmm. and it seems like we're getting to the point where the natural next evolution is obviously going to become with integrating the mount into the scope. For right. I hope so. Obvious reasons. I think there's a way you could do it that wouldn't cause a lot of headache. And we talked about it last time, but I don't. I don't want to get into it. Cause... Yeah, just I mean, it, <clears throat> it's it's not dissimilar from how red dots are mounted on pistons. Right. You know, plates, shims, whatever you need. But you know, if you look at you know where I think optics are going to go, uh, if you look at the XM157 from the NGSW contract for the Army, that's the new Vortex with all the smart bullshit built in. Is it's a what is is it a one to ten? I can't remember. It's a LPVO with uh, I don't remember. I thought it was a one eight. It's an LPVO with a bunch of smart features built in, but also the mounts built in. Nicely BDX system. Um, yeah, but it's but it's better because yeah. it's from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Uh, they have good cheese it's, there. It's basically like a highly, highly advanced BDX system. Yeah. So you know, effectively, what they did is um, 
they you know, if you think about like the negative space, even on like pick up the VCOG again or pick up any of them, pick up the the one closest to you. VCOG. Yeah. So look, I mean, you have, look how much negative space you have there. Like having to have that offset, you know, you could throw a battery in there. You, like what all could you like right here? Actually, power. Well, I'm saying on like a traditional right show, on the mountain, everything. Instead of like dealing, dicking with these little CR twenty thirty twos that have shit battery life. Give me a powered rail. Yeah. Not the handguard. Well, I guess for a tactical standpoint, but they should like, I don't know. It should interface to where there's power in this mounting. But yeah, thing. I mean, if, but if you get to the point where you're integrating the optic with a range finder and a damn ballistics, uh, yeah. software and all that, it's you're like, eating through some batteries. Yeah. And you know, there's, I'm sure from a engineering standpoint, integrating the mount will allow you to make certain design decisions, which will allow you to decrease weight mm -hmm. like comparatively, uh, I mean, you're going to add that weight back in with other shit yeah. to your benefit. But yeah, that is a archaic, outdated, old method of doing things that honestly, I think one of the biggest reasons why it hasn't changed is the is the actual aesthetics of it. <laughs> and I agree because like... Uh, and no one likes change. Well, no, it's hard. Like think about like even like we, you know, we talked about this LPVO and Bolt Gun podcast. Uh, you know, it's... Yeah, it's clearly <laughs> by today's standards... On like shorter range style hunting rifles, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, LPVO is the best choice. Like, there's n absolutely no reason to run three to nines all the way up to four to twelves based off some optics. Anything underneath that, like, there's absolutely no reason why you wouldn't want an LPVO on your boat gun. Like, the, it has all the positives and none of the negatives, but it doesn't look traditional. Like there's no large objective, and that's what you run into on, on a lot of stuff. Like it just, just don't look traditional. We can't even convince half these people that you don't need a 28 inch barrel, let alone. Oh, ho, ho, ho. you do if you're shooting 308. <laughs> now, before we head out, wait, was that our first insult of three way on today? Probably. Mm, I don't know. That's they true. flow so easily. Uh, before we head out, let's talk about where to mount your optic or your mount or whatever on a plane. We have one really dedicated <laughs> fan who should, if you're like not paying attention right now, you uh, can please tune in. tune in, take some notes, if you will, a uh, dedicated loyal listener. Uh, we're going to, we're going to learn you something real fast. Uh, up here is a no go on the handguard. No go. You want to try and get your mount on the upper receiver. Now, I don't even want to get in. Like, we got into this more last one. I don't even want to get into, like, all the hand guard yeah. movement and all the other bullshit. Just put it on the upper receiver and be done with, like, your optic mount. That's itself. why the cantilever exists. Yes, exactly. That's 100% why it exists. Now, let's talk about... We talked about mounting procedure a little bit more in last one. I'll just briefly talk on it real fast. Like, my particular mounting procedure for a cantilever mount, LPVO, long-range scope, and everything else. Obviously, like, an LPVO or red dot is going to be vastly different than the care I take with a long range optic. But for the sake of this, we're just going to briefly talk about it. Cause we talked about how to mount scopes and one of the other ones for long range. So I'm just going to kind of, you know, not talk on that LPVOs. So most time, like the whole point of LPVO is low powered variable optic. It's like going to be capped at one ten X. So I'm not going to be traditionally running this, more long ranges so i'm not going to get as crazy about getting the reticle true but i still do a procedure in which i true the reticle i just you know it's being it's an lpvo and it'll go down to one x i can do it within in, in the confines of my little room there which is a 20 foot container essentially where i do most of that type of work uh and i have level lines and plumb bobs on the wall and that's how i go ahead and like i pull the optic off put it on my little short action customs uh, thing scope mounting thing and true the reticle all that kind of good stuff but I, I don't i don't get too crazy like and again if i was just putting together a full-on predator hunting rifle uh a lot of times like i'm never going to shoot this over 200 yards i will literally base it off of how it looks to my eye and that's it because like it doesn't matter 200 yards in i don't care i want it to look good through my eye i want everything lined up properly through my eye. now 
there's a lot of pros to the AR platform as far as mounting optics and mounts and everything else. So, again, like he said, the good thing about the cantilever mount is you kind of you kind of know where it's gonna about where it's gonna be or where you can mount it because it is cantilevered and you are working within the confines of the upper receiver. Now you do have adjustment where you place the scope on the mount, but you kind of already know where the mount's gonna typically end end up on the upper receiver. So that makes things significantly easier. You also have, again, this isn't a good example because this is like more of a fixed style stock, but most ARs are adjustable butt stocks. So you have a little bit of leeway there to where like, not like a boat gun or anything like that where your length of pull is fixed. Like you have plenty of leeway there to kind of do like a generic mounting and not, and be totally fine with like longer stocks such as this, uh, a Gen 3 light in like a scope such as this or whatever, like a generic eye relief. Uh, you're going to be out here towards the end of the re receiver, maybe a little bit further back on this particular longer stock. Like, But a, a generic uh, carbine length buffer stock, the best thing you could do when you're actually mounting the optic is place the eyepiece at the back of the receiver essentially. And that's going to cover you for ma majority of your optics, generic eye reliefs, unless you're an ACOG, then you just got to shove it directly in your eyeball like a fucking monocle. Yeah, I said I wasn't going to say that for it. <laughs> but most LPVOs, uh, there's very, it, you, as you mount a few more in uh, these cantilever mounts, you'll start to see like lots of similarities. Now, there are exceptions to everything. Like there are some optics that are very compact. And you have, you'll kind of have to maybe change the way you're going to mount it. But as long as you're falling on the upper receiver, and as long as that eyepiece of your optic kind of falls somewhere around the back of the receiver, for most scenarios, most carbine length uh, gas uh, buffer systems and everything else, it's going to be fine. Like you can, again, get your fine adjustment in with uh, the length of pull on your buttstock, and uh, you'll be able to cover the, th the greatest thing about ARs and hunting in general is the fact that the buttstock will collapse. So I can go from shooting it myself, hand it to a smaller statured person, or hand it to a larger statured person, they fully expand it. Like it's, it makes it very easy as a, like a kid's tool. And then, you know, there's a certain cool element too that kids really enjoy, but follow the manufacturer's specs. You could always pull it right back off and look at it yourself, like redo something, like just don't mount it on a handguard. You know who you are. <laughs> Follow manufacturer specs. Buy good stuff, and that's pretty much it. I mean, we're gonna wrap it up there. We've been we've been rambling for a hot minute here. Uh, and again, as always, go check out allymunitions.com or if you're in Midland, stop by All Outdoors. And if you see me on the floor, say hey. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about some hunting or shooting or anything else like that. Or if you look angry, I'll just be like, I'll go get Wade for you real fast. <laughs> yeah, if you're in the right band. Uh, you know, that's pretty much it for this one. Uh, let's know if you have any questions down below. If you uh, I feel like you want us to cover it anymore, I don't know what else we could possibly say. Uh, or if you have suggestions for certain mounts that we didn't cover, and you think you you know got a good suggestion, let us know in the comments. Uh, we maybe there's something out there we need to get test out and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, any any closing thoughts, Betsy? Oh, oh yeah, we talked about another one. Six arc is coming. Uh, it's officially coming. I should have the brass today, as a matter of fact, which by the time you're watching this would have been last week. <laughs> uh, it's going to take a couple of weeks to like get everything squared away and get it on the website. You better be fast on the trigger. I can tell you that right now. We're having it like with, right now with 22 Creed, as fast as I load it, put it on the website, it's gone. So we're going to be, again, I'm trying to get staffed up, but you know, Due to where munitions is, it's going to be a little bit harder than anything else. But, you know, we appreciate everyone. Appreciate your likes, subscribes, and comments. And, uh, you know, just remember, you can pay me off to get a picture of Vinci. That's totally, it's only within the limits here. Uh, any final words? No. <laughs> Are you done with this? Because we've done this a few times. <laughs> That's why I know I'm like, I just... I can't I have nothing to say, which is rare. That is rare. He's over there fantasizing about his Taylor Swift concert, folks. Yeah, no, I'm I'm mentally checked out of this town. 
Well, anyways, we'll see you guys next time.